Now, the thing I want to make really clear, so computing the full minimax tree is totally impossible because it's just way huge. It would take way too long and be too hard to store um, unless, like, if you're Jonathan Schaefer who computed all the positions in chess, actually only the reachable ones that he needed in order to compute the minimax value for the root, um, which are the only ones you would reach in gameplay against a perfect player. A checker. Um, now, what people do in practice is more along the lines of where I think Jeff was going earlier, which is they have some artificial depth bound. So you do a depth limited minimax tree. And then instead of having leaf values that correspond to terminal states of the game, you've got leaves that are just like, we're in the middle of playing at some random board position. What do I write here? What's the value? It's not a terminal state. I don't know. It's not a, either I haven't backed up anything from a leaf or it's not a leaf itself. So what, it, what do I do? So you invent some crazy heuristic. And um, in games, that's called a static evaluation function. Uh, whoa, that was not the right thing to press. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, let's try that. There we go. Static evaluation function. So I think I even have the word. Static, yeah, static evaluation function, right there on a slide, just to make you less worried that I'm spending so long in introductory questions. We're actually already halfway through today's lecture. Um, so you partially expand the tree down to some depth bound, and then you run your static evaluator to make up some number for how good the board position is. Um, so you have like a pretend backed up value. Um, so that's what people do in practice. So then the question is, okay, just the way we have to struggle to come up with heuristic functions to make a uh, single agent search like A star work in some domain. We need to come up with some kind of heuristic evaluation, some static evaluator that is guessing how good this board position is for me. Same kind of deal. Yeah. Now these two questions are the same basically and they say um, uh, if the minimax tree is growing exponentially and we can only explore the very top of it, wh what do we do? How can computers possibly play games proficiently? Um, is there anything we can do? Can we, is there, how do we go deeper? Uh, if, we just, if we don't have time to look at zillions of nodes in a minimax tree, what do we do? Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, there's a, a, a speed up to minimax search called alpha beta, alpha beta pruning. And that's my goal is to have you understand that by the end of the lecture today, alpha beta pruning. Any more questions? All right. So let's not skip all of these slides. Um, so yeah, here I have static evaluation function written right there. So let's just do an example with tic-tac-toe just so you see minimax search going. Um, Here's an example static evaluator. Extremely lame, but it actually works not so bad on tic-tac-toe because tic-tac-toe is a very small game. So the value of position is uh, wonderful if I win and terrible if I lose. And otherwise, it's this. The number of three lengths, everyone understand what a three length is? It's like a bunch of three cells that could be a win. So number of three lengths that are I could still win minus the number of three lengths that you could still win. That's the static evaluator. Very simple. You know, so it's the strength of the board for me. It's not hard to come up with some kind of static evaluation function. Um, OK, so here's, alpha, here's, here's minimax search. Here's the start. And there are a bunch of different moves that can be made. Now, there are only three moves drawn here. And why is that? Symmetries, exactly. Um, you can just rotate this around to have to move in any of the corners. So there's a corner move, there's a side move, and there's a middle move. So, so here Max gets to go, and then Min gets to go. Uh, here, O moves. And now we run the stat. If, if this is a two-ply minimax tree, one ply, two ply, then this is what you get. You get all these board positions and you, you add up the, uh, the number of three lengths that are open for x, which is one, two, three, four, uh, five, six. 
minus the number of three lengths that are open for O, uh, which is one, two, three, four, five. O doesn't have that other diagonal. So this, is, this position is one, has a value of one. Now O is going to move, and we do that for each board here, and you get one, zero, one, zero, negative one. So O is trying to go here. O is min. So obviously O is going to go to the negative one. So the minimax value for this node is negative one. You do that same thing for each of these other moves, and you end up with minimax values of negative one, negative two, and one. So where does max go? It goes to the one. All right. Now, max goes here, and then min's going to make a move. I think the next slide assumes that min has already made a move. Um, yeah. Um, we assume that min takes, takes this side move for some reason uh, right here. And that's now, that's now the current situation. Now Max is trying to figure out what response to play. So again, look at all the possible next moves. And for each of them, look at all the moves that O is going to make. Run the static evaluator because we're just doing a two-ply search. And if you follow this out, it actually, I think, I think uh, X wins. Um, this little static evaluator is an, is with two-ply search is enough for, for Max to, to win. Um, so this becomes one, zero, one, zero. So now we have two tied moves. They're both equally strong. You pick one at random. Um, so everyone understands Minimax search? Very straightforward. Very straightforward. Um, oh, yeah, I think here, well, we avoid the negative infinities. Is, is Max going to Is Max going to win here? Uh, I think so. Certainly not going to lose. Anyway, the program can actually play reasonably strongly. It's quite amazing. Um, okay, so we already talked about uh, partial expansion in the static evaluator. Or symmetries were mentioned. The way that people handle symmetries is by having kind of like a, uh, usually in games, is by having a kind of a, 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 fixed, a fixed size closed list, a little cache. It's like a closed list. It's called a transposition table because it takes care of these symmetries where things are transposed. Um, <coughs> and usually this is, it's just very much like an LRU cache. You just keep track of stuff and there's some replacement policy um, for if you run out of space, what do you do? Um, now, we've got a depth bound here, and, and uh, so I, I think I mentioned last time that a lot of times the strength setting on a computer game program is what ply does it search to. But sometimes in games, instead of having a depth bound, you have a time limit. Like in chess, there's certain varieties of chess where you have uh, like a one minute per move or something like that. Um, so, um, What's actually very commonly done in game programs is what? <laughs> yes, it's to do exactly what I wrote on the, th uh, the slide here, which is you do basically iterative deepening. So you do a complete depth first search to a particular depth bound. And then if you have more time, you go back and do it again with a deeper bound. And if you, can, if you happen to be able to store some of the minimax values in your transposition table as you're going along, then you can do child ordering in the next iteration based on the values that you calculated in the previous one. Um, so that's a, a common enhancement. Um, and so a lot of people wonder at this point, like, okay, how realistic is this, right? We have a program that's trying to play games by brute force search of some tree, with this iteratively increasing depth bound. I mean, this is so not how, not how people play chess. At which point, of course, I'm compelled to show you a picture that was made by a psychologist studying grandmaster chess players. And the, you get the grandmaster to talk about what they're thinking about. These uh, squares here are the positions that were eventually considered. And these are the ones that were considered at first. 
These are the ones that were considered next. These are the ones that were considered next. Gradually filling in across the tree. It's not strictly depth limited. You can see the, this, this master has gone quite deep over here before really going here much. Um, so there's definitely, it's more like iterative deepening A star than it is like strict depth bounded iterative deepening. But like this was stuff made by psychologists. So it's like, wow, humans are kind of doing IDA star when they play chess, <laughs> which is, I think, rather amazing. Um, so just wanted to point that out. <laughs>